Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And now show you the face of the earth. earth. Let us pray. O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, has instructed the hearts of thy faithful. Grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray, Pray for us. Saint jo Joseph Cupertino. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Matthew. Pray, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we cover the Tenth Commandment. We saw the Ninth Commandment in detail last time. This is the Tenth Commandment and the precepts of the Holy Catholic Church. Tenth Commandment, which is the last, but not the least. The Tenth Commandment of God is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. So what is forbidden by this? The Tenth Commandment forbids all desire to take or to keep unjustly what belongs to another. It also forbids envy at their success. So envy is one of those sins. Envy is precisely to be sad at another's success. Material success, spiritual success intellectual success, such as uh, degrees or bachelors, etc., to be jealous at others' success, and uh, others doing better, others progressing better than I. So the true remedy, of course, is charity. The charity to see that God gives his gifts differently, his whole mystical body of the Holy Catholic Church, he gives us gifts differently, some to heal, some to preach, some to teach, some to, to suffer and suffer patiently, some to pray, some to nurse by nursing our medical. So everybody has their talents and it all helps for the common good of the whole mystical body of Christ. We see in the angels, not even among the angels, there is not equality. Equality is one of those modern lies that, every, that, that, that everything is just a heap of sand and everybody is just equal. That's not how God made things. That's not reality. Even in a tree, you do not have equality. The roots do not do the work of the bark. And the, and the bark does not do the same as the leaves and the fruits. But the fruits need the roots, and the leaves need the bark. Everything needs each other, but they're not equal. The roots are not the fruits. The leaves are not the, the, the inside of the bark, etc., etc., etc. So there's inequality in a tree. And in all the universe, there's inequality. In the human race, there's inequality. Equality is only in the between men it's only two things one we're all born we're all born of our mothers in that way we're all equal yes and the only other way is we're gonna all gonna die and be judged that's it but the freemasons push this whole idea since the french revolution of a false equality that everyone is absolutely equal between races, between genders, between people and that common sense shows you that's just simply not true because there, there are those who govern those who have more, more understanding, more gifts of wisdom to govern some are gifted to work with their hands, craftsmen and some are just happy to beg in the street and live like that and they really don't want a job They really. So some, even in human society, there is differences and hierarchical proportion that helps the whole common good. And that's the way God built it. Even among the angels, there is not equality. God has put the highest, the seraphim, the cherubim, thrones, dominations, powers, all the way down to the angels. And the angels do not have the same 
gifts, the same happiness of heaven as the seraphim. They're all full, but the seraphim have a greater glory than the angels. And that's just God does not create everything equal. Inequality is necessary to make anything work. For a car or a truck to work, the spark plug cannot be the steering wheel. The gas cannot do the work of the oil. Everything has its part, some a minor part like windshield fluid, and some a major part like, like the engine but you, and the steering wheel. But all of it, you need the wheels, you need everything to help one coordinated, in equal effort, all of them doing their part for the good of the whole vehicle, for example. So if that's the way for a car, how much more for the complications of the entire universe that God created. Even in our human eyeball, there's over 200 operations that have to work all together at once. And not everything is equal. So this false idea of equality. So envy comes from the roots being jealous of the, the leaves or the fruits. And that's foolish. So envy is a lack of reality. But the devil is said to be most envious. Green with envy. Why? Because we can obtain the happiness that he has lost. So envy is a sin that breaks especially the Tenth Commandment. It is permissible, it is permissible, says the Catechism here, to seek material prosperity if we do so honestly and do not expose ourselves to the proximate dangers of sin, such as by stealing, cheating, lying, to get ahead. Ecclesiasticus 14.8, the Holy Ghost says, The eye of the envious is wicked. Luke chapter 12, 15, Take heed and guard yourself from all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. A man's life doesn't consist in how much he owns. And think of St. Joseph. St. Joseph was content with what he had. And even the little he had, he had to abandon when, at the flight into Egypt. And in Egypt, they had to live, St. Joseph, Our Lady, and the Child Jesus had to live like nomads, going from shelter to shelter to place to place, and he had to support a family in a language he didn't know, hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and among a people, the Egyptians, who scorned the Israelites, the Jews. They didn't like the Jews. So, St. Joseph, he's a great model for fathers of families who struggle to support their family. Turn to St. Joseph, he knows all about it. Turn to him and he will always provide. And that's why parents should never be afraid to take all the children God sends, because he will always provide for the children, always. He'll give a raise in the salary, he'll provide some means an inheritance, whatever it is. Never be one of those who will say, well, we got to calculate and measure. We shouldn't have more than five children. We shouldn't have another child because we can't afford it. That's to mock God. We have to be simple and just take the children God sends. So, as a married family. So, um, also, 1 Timothy 6.10, St. Paul says, For covetousness is the root of all evils. And some, in their eagerness to get rich, have strayed from the faith and have involved themselves in many troubles. Well said. For covetousness, greediness, is the root of all evils. And elsewhere it says the love of money. Also, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your manner of life be without avarice. Be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will not leave thee, neither will I forsake thee. So our Lord's own words, he won't abandon those who turn to him. Here's some comments on the catechism here. Many persons, by not paying their just debts, are guilty of sins against the seventh commandment. Some claim that they are unable to pay, yet they continue to buy luxuries, a fact which shows that they are not sincere. 
There are even some who deliberately refuse to pay a debt even though they know it, that it was contracted. If the, co if the creditor has no written proof of his claim, God's law of justice is not limited to what can be proven in a civil court. So we have to be men of our word. If we give our word, we have to keep those words. Sins of the tongue which injure others are also prevalent. Without the least qualm of conscience, men lie to their fellow men. There are many who gravely injure the reputation of their fellows by their uncharitable, often false remarks and stories. Backbiting, tail-bearing, the violation of secrets that one should keep, rash judgments, how common these are today. And he concludes, Catholics, followers of our Lord, who was so attentive to the rights of others, should try to lead men to observe these commandments. And the best way is to inspire them by good example. We must be strictly honest in our dealings with others. Even when there is a question of something of slight value, we must never take it or keep it if it belongs to another. How many, for example, seem to think that if they find something in the street, they are entitled to keep it without an attempt to find the owner. That's the key thing. You find $50, you got to look around and ask, did you lose money, did you lose money? And if nobody claims it, than finders keepers. But if someone says, yeah, I lost it, I lost money. How much? I lost, it must be $50. Where'd you, I was walking over there, did you find it? Oh yeah, I did find it, here it is, $50. It must be you dropped it. So, um, similarly, we must watch over our speech, rejecting every form of lies or falsehood, carefully avoiding anything that might wound our neighbor's character, shunning rash or harsh judgments about our neighbor. Do not judge, you may not be judged, Christ says, Matthew 7. So, that concludes the Ten Commandments, the Tenth Commandment. Now we're going to move on to the Six Precepts of the Church. So what are these precepts? What is the, what are, what's the, can the Catholic Church make laws? From where has the Catholic Church to write the right to make laws? The Catholic Church has the right to make laws from Jesus Christ, who said to the apostles, the first bishops of his church, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven. So the power of the keys, this is called, given to the Pope, and to bishops, <coughs> not equally, but it's, they are given power. The church does have the power from Christ to make laws and to enforce their observance. It is a mortal sin to disobey a law of the church in a serious matter, a venial sin in a slight manner. The church has indirect power over those temporal matters which are necessary are useless for the salvation of men. He therefore said to them again, Peace be to you. This is at the, our Lord's resurrection. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. By whom is this right to make laws exercised? This right to make laws is exercised by the bishops, the successors of the apostles, and especially by the Pope, who, as the successor of the chief of the apostles, St. Peter, has the right to make laws for the universal church. So here we touch a question of the, the laws of the church, which is summarized in canon law. And the supreme law of the whole canon law is the salvation of souls. So with the new code of canon law in 1983, Pope John Paul II, he expressly stated that this new code of 83 is implementing all the documents and principles and errors of Vatican II. So that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said the New Code of Canon Law is full of heresies and the, the laws that are definitely influenced, such as giving communion to Protestants, which is a sacrilege, but allowed by the New Code of Canon Law, 
that has to be rejected. All these codes that are imbued with religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, freedom of conscience, all the errors of ecumenism which saturate the new code of canon law, we must reject. So obviously, in normal times, the Pope and the bishops seek to protect the Catholic faith and not undermine it and destroy it. So this is, this. you cannot talk about the laws of the church and you cannot talk about uh, canonical settings or positions without understanding that we are in a major war for the survival of the Catholic faith right now. So that's the error of Bishop Follet and the new stand of the new SSPX. They talk about canonical um, canonical solutions, they talk about all these things and obedience to the Pope, but totally forgetting that we are in a major change of the faith, a change of the Catholic faith by Vatican II. So you cannot ignore that. So what are the chief commandments and laws of the Church? There are six of them. So let's go through these quickly. These are the age-old precepts of the Church. First, we got to assist at Mass on all Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. What is the divine law? The divine law says you have to sanctify Sunday. Who changed the Holy Day from Saturday, the Sabbath, to Sunday? Who did? It was the Apostles. St. Peter himself, the first Pope. That was one of his first actions as Pope, was change the Lord's Day from the Sabbath to Sunday. Why Sunday? Because that's the day Christ rose from the dead. And that is the, the new Lord's Day, the sacred day called Sunday. So, Dominica in Latin. So how the church law says, how do we sanctify Sunday? You go to Mass and on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. So obviously this is understood as a Mass that is Catholic and not compromising, not a novice ordo mass, not a motu proprio or indult mass, and not by priests who accept Vatican II and the new religion. We're talking here about the mass said by priests who have the Catholic faith of all time, with no compromise of Vatican II. Archbishop Lefebvre also used to say, don't go to the Sede Vicantis masses either. So, so that's the first law of the church. So what do you do when you, you, don't, you have no resistance priests for many miles away. You only see them once in a while. And uh, your local novice order, you can't go. You can't go to the Indult. You can't go to St. Peter's. You can't go to the St. Picantis. What do you do? You sanctify the Sunday still because that's God's law. But you say the prayers of Mass. You make a spiritual communion with your family. Get the kids to dress up with suit and tie, their best dress. Have a good meal after. And, um, you know, think about it, if, if in the Eastern Rite, the Mass can go on for three hours, easily, every, every Sunday. It's not asking much for Catholics who cannot get to Mass, read the Missal, pray the three rosaries, hear or read a sermon. This is how we sanctify the Sunday. Second law of the Church, to fast and abstain on the days appointed. Fast and abstain. So we'll cover this a little more in detail, but for now, fasting is, if one can handle it, all right, no food all day, just drink. But the law of the church is one full meal and two snacks, basically. That's a fast day. I know for many people that's, that's no problem, that's not even a fast day. But that's, that's the, the directives of the Holy Catholic Church from tradition. One full meal, two snacks. Abstinence obliges at age 7 all the way up to 65 and older if, if they can take it. Abstinence means don't eat meat, for example. Every single Friday, Catholics don't eat meat. Why? Why? Because that's the day Christ died on the cross. And that's a practice from the apostles themselves. You give up the joy of eating a hamburger and bacon because on that day Christ died so cruelly in suffering on the cross. Third, 
to confess our sins at least once a year. Once a year, confession. Once a year, confession. So think about it. How many of us are going to save our souls just going to confession once a year? It's not going to be too easy. Go as often as you can. And it's, and it's good to confess venial sins if you have no mortal sins to confess. And of course, all mortal sins must be confessed. And there are circumstances and number and etc. So we have to go at least once a year. So Mother Church just lowers the rope as low as she can go to, to get souls to heaven. And for, for many people in the old days, uh, this had more meaning because if they lived way out in the country, or in Alaska, or way out in the mountains of Montana, they could hardly see a priest but once a year. So, and the priests would make their rounds on horse or on foot. So today it's a lot easier with traveling. So once a year at least confession, but obviously we need to go more often. Third, or fourth precept of the church, to receive communion during Easter time. So Holy Communion during Easter time. Receiving Holy Communion during Easter time. So what is Easter time? It's from the Septuagesima Sunday to Trinity Sunday. That's a long time to make your one Holy Communion. And that's obliging by the church law because um, Mother Church wants to keep us close to the Holy Eucharist. Obviously, if, if you can go to communion more than once, you, you must go. The saints all say, go every day if you can. And to miss one Holy Communion, you, you lose many graces, you lose many helps for the souls in purgatory, you lose many graces for many souls on earth who otherwise could save their soul if you offer your, first, your Holy Communion. Fifth precept, to contribute to the support of the church. Some will word it, support the pastors. Support the church. So, some people tend to think that um, you're obliged by the church law to pay 10% of your salary. But that's not a Catholic, that's a Protestant thing. It's generous, and no Catholic priest will ever complain about that, that's for sure. But there's no law of the church that states that. But the church just says, give what you can to the support of the, of the pastors. So the pastors, the priests... Um, labor to feed the souls and it's it's partly injustice and partly out of charity also to support the pastors the priests that, f that bring you the holy sacraments and fly uh, in our case when we fly any any penny helps to play, pay for the the flights and the travel etc so contribute to the support of the church so this this is even in the in the epistles of St. Paul. And St. Paul worked with his hands to show that he wasn't just about, you know, reaping off the benefits of the people, of the faithful. But <clears throat> Christ tells his apostles, eat what's put before you and uh, walk without carrying any wallet or anything. So support of the church. So this is quite clear in common sense. And it's uh, a duty of justice as well. And when you support the church, obviously the priests who receive the money often goes to the church itself, the construction of the church, or the support of the host, the wine. And also, as St. Gregory the Great and St. John Chrysostom say, many people will give money to the priests, and that's their way of giving money to the poor. Because the priests easily give out to the poor, to the hungry, to those in need. And who do they turn to? But to the priest. So many times, wealthy people will help the priest to help the poor. Because uh, people are more apt to turn to a priest than just anybody they don't know. So remember that when you give to the priest, also into the church, you're also indirectly helping the poor. And then the sixth precepts of the church is to observe the laws of the church concerning marriage. 
the laws of the church concerning marriage. So we'll, we'll see more of this in detail. But one of the laws of the church concerning marriage is an obvious. If a Catholic who's baptized marries before a justice of the peace, that's invalid. That's not a marriage at all. For a baptized Catholic, it has to be before a priest. It has to be by church law. So many people today, many Catholic young people are marrying <clears throat> before the justice of the peace. <clears throat> and the parents call and say, can I go to this marriage? And we have to say, no, it's not even a marriage. It's not even a marriage. So we have to know these laws of the church, which we'll consider more in detail. So, what sin does a Catholic... So now we'll look more deeply. We're going to go more deeply into the precepts of the church. We'll cover a few in these next few minutes, and then pick up with the next catechism class. What sin does a Catholic commit who through his own fault misses Mass on Sunday or Holy Days of Obligation? So obviously, if you got Mass, and a real Mass with a real Catholic priest with no compromise with Vatican II in the new Mass or Sinevicantism, you better be at Mass or you'll answer to God. That's a mortal sin to miss. When you got it within an hour away, you better be there. Now, when the church made these laws that you're not obliged to travel more than an hour to get to Sunday Mass, that's in the days of horse and buggy with dirt roads. And if it's raining, you're, you're trucking through tons of mud. So when the church made these laws, um, we have it so much easier right now. It's no problem for people to get in a car to drive an hour. They're going to do that to see any football games, college football, college basketball, hockey. No problem to do that. And some men have to travel three hours every morning to get to work and three hours back. So to give God on Sunday when you can travel to a resistance, Catholic resistance mass, then you better, God will bless you for that generosity. Um, we have seen people travel four hours, five hours, even 15 hours to come to one Mass. And God bless them for that, and He certainly reward them. The grave obligation to hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation does not bind the following. First, those who must care for the sick. So a daughter who takes care of her mother, who's very sickly, who can't go to the bathroom on her own, obviously she is excused from Sunday Mass, but still must sanctify the day. Second, those whose illness does not permit them to go outdoors. So someone so sick and going outdoors in the winter, for example, will just make them far more sick. Obviously, they cannot go to Mass. Sanctify the Sunday at home. And if you've got internet, you can, uh, every Sunday here we watch, every Sunday we have Mass here at Boston, Kentucky, at the seminary. It's filmed live, the Sunday Mass. It's filmed live, and that's a, a work of charity for the production here, 469 Fitter and Our Lady Mount Carmel, so that those at home and bedridden can look at the Mass. And remember Archbishop Lefebvre wrote back to that lady from Trinidad Islands when she said, I have no Tridentine Mass on these islands, we only have the new Mass, but we have a conservative novice or a priest. He says Mass reverently. He wears his cassock, he preaches the rosary. Can I go to that new Mass? What did Archbishop Lefebvre say? Did he say, oh yes, you can go because you can nourish your faith at that new Mass? He did not say that because he knew the new Mass is poison. So he wrote back and said, don't go to the new Mass, but here's a cassette tape, <laughs> a cassette tape, the old-fashioned cassette, and listen to this for your sanctification of your Sunday Mass. And he put, wrote the letter through one of his priests. It was, it was printed in the recusant about a month or two ago. And you should see that. So now you don't just have a cassette tape. You can actually watch the full color Mass going on at the same time. And like Padre Pio used to say, you can send your guardian angel to Mass to adore our Lord in the sacrifice and make a spiritual communion. And third reason... Those who live a considerable distance from a church. So today it wouldn't just be an hour. 
It wouldn't just be on. Unless you're old and you can't see at night, then they have an excuse. But in our days of fancy cars with air conditioning and smooth highways, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. Of course, God, um, we should be generous with God as He is to us. And then the last reason that excuses from a grave obligation of the Sunday Mass, those who must give immediate attention to urgent work. So the roof just caved in from a storm last night and the whole house will be destroyed unless you fix it immediately. So the dad has to take his boys and fix it. That's an obvious urgent necessity. The horses break out of the barn, they break out of the corral, and they're running all over to the neighbors and into the, into the roads or into the streets. Yeah, well, you got an emergency on your hands. Our grandpa drops from a heart attack Sunday morning on the way to Mass. You can turn around and take care of him. These are obvious, urgent needs. So, Christ respects common sense. And as it says in Scripture, if, which Christ quoted to the Pharisees, if your donkey or your cow falls into a pit on Sunday, on the Sabbath day, of course you can take him out. Because if he's down there, he'll break his leg and he'll get sick and die. So on Sunday, you can help your animals get out of a urgent necessity. So if that's the case for animals, all the more for our neighbor who might be in need or in trouble. So, um, there are four other Holy Days of Obligation. Oh, the Holy Days of Obligation in the United States. Let's just look at these briefly and I'll close with this, okay? The first Holy Day of Obligation, Christmas, December 25th. Second, January 1st, the circumcision of our Divine Lord. Third, Ascension Thursday, 40 days after Easter, is a Holy Day of Obligation. Is Ash Wednesday a Holy Day of Obligation? A lot of people call up and ask. No, it's not. It's not Ash Wednesday. But it's a good, obviously, go if you have the opportunity. Uh, fourth, the Holy Assumption of the Virgin Mary to Heaven, August 15th. Holy, that's a Holy Day of Obligation in the United States. Fifth, All Saints Day, November 1st. Sixth, the Immaculate Conception, December 8th. So those are the Holy Days of Obligation in the United States. And uh, we'll close with that. And next time we'll look into the rest of the precepts of the Church. And we'll be uh, carrying on with the next questions of the Catechism, which will touch on the sacraments of the Catholic Church and prayer. Okay? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and thou our death. Amen. St. Matthew, pray for us. St. Teresa, pray for us. St. Pius X, pray for us. Nomine Patris, Epiphanes, Virgis Sancti. Amen.